and I just remind you that if you have a mobile phone to make sure that it is switched off or that it is on silent or like more. We're starting today a new series on Paul's letter to Timothy. The Apostle Paul is in prison and he is awaiting execution and he now believes that it is coming near and is writing to Timothy, a young, I believe he was a young man and pastor in Ephesus and the Apostle Paul is preparing the church for the future. That's what we have to do as leaders, as pastors, we have to prepare the church for the future. And the Apostle Paul, the Apostles, the time of the Apostles was coming to an end. So a new generation of leaders were emerging and they were to be trained, equipped and appointed and the church to be led. Who is Timothy? Anyone who is young in the faith. Now you might be someone who is uh, inquiring about the faith. You, know, you might be just starting out in your Christian life. You are like Timothy. Timothy was young. He wasn't a young believer, but he was young as a young man and he was mature spiritually and a leader in the church. But Timothy really is anyone who is starting. You might find yourself at the start, at the beginning of the Christian life. You might even think of yourself as someone who is timid. To be timid is to really be shy and be fearful of doing anything in public, of speaking in public, of witnessing in public. Uh, Timothy was, you know, in his personality, he was a shy person. We're all very different. We're not, thankfully, thank God, that we're all different. Every one of you is different from each other. Some of us are shy people, and some of us are, you know, very outgoing and extroverts, have no problems in making friends and speaking to strangers. Some people are like that, but not everyone is the same. Timothy was very shy, and he was fearful of really taking the responsibilities and uh, <clears throat> feeling that he was inadequate, that he wasn't up to it. Maybe that is how you feel today. Well, this is for you and for me. Because the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy to encourage him. We need, more than anything else, we need encouragement. We need, you know, to encourage each other, to help each other, to hold our hands, to hold our hands up, uh, and to strengthen each other's hands, to encourage us, to go on, to keep fighting the good fight of the Christian faith. And so the Apostle Paul does that in four different ways. Uh, in this chapter, he encourages Timothy not to be timid, but to be bold and to be brave. And he does that, first of all, by remembrance, remembering certain things about Timothy and what God has done in the life of Timothy and what the relationship that Paul had to him. First thing he says to him really is in the opening sentence, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. No one appointed in the New Testament themselves. No one went forward and said, make me a leader. It didn't happen. 
and it shouldn't happen even today. It's the wrong way. It is God who calls people into leadership. It's a call of God. That's what Paul says, it's a call of God. But it is according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. So that is something, you know, Paul is reminding Timothy of the deep roots of where he is standing. This is like from the Old Testament. The promise of life has to do with the promises made hundreds and thousands of years earlier to a man called Abraham. That is how deep is the Christian faith. It's not something that, you know, Queen Elizabeth II drummed up, you know, people used to think, oh, well, she, because she's the head of the Church of England, she used to be, because she's dead now, her son is the King Charles, is the head now. But they are not, you know, the ones who brought about the Christian faith. The Christian faith goes back to Abraham and to the promise of life given to him. God gave Abraham a promise. And in the New Testament, we receive the benefit of that promise by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. To Timothy, my beloved child. Timothy had heard the gospel through the Apostle Paul and had come to faith listening to the gospel through the lips and the life of the Apostle Paul. That was a special relationship between Paul and Timothy. I thank God, Paul says, as I serve him in, with a clear conscience, and I remember you constantly in my prayers, night and day. So Timothy was, you know, after he came to faith, the Apostle Paul prayed for him as he did for many, many Christians, praying for them and urging them to pray for him. Prayer is very important. Do you pray? Have you prayed? Have you ever prayed? Maybe you've never prayed. Maybe you do not know what is praying. You hear other people praying, you hear the pastor praying, you, but you don't know what prayer is. Well, may I encourage you to learn the first prayer that anyone can learn is God be merciful to me, a sinner. That's where you start. God be merciful to me, a sinner. May God have mercy on me, a sinner. May God save me through his son Jesus Christ. And then when that happens, you will start praying, you will start giving thanks to God for salvation. The Apostle Paul remembers Timothy in his prayers. Day and night he prays for him. I remember your tears and I long to see you. Well, why, why was Timothy crying? Well, Timothy was crying Maybe because they were, you know, they had to part, they had to be separated. The Apostle Paul uh, was on the run, was arrested, uh, and, and maybe it was, you know, tears of joy. And I longed to see you. The Apostle Paul had a number of people that he loved. He loved all Christians, but there were certain Christians that he loved more than others in a way. And he greatly desired their company. Other people, you know, Christians, godly people, men and women, whose company you so long to have, to be in their company, to have fellowship with them. I know a lot of people like that. I know I long to have fellowship with them, to be in their company, because when we are in their company with people like that, they lift us up. And there are people that have been passed through my life in whose presence I've been, and who have, you know, urged me and stirred me up and really made me aware of the presence of God. There are some people who are carrying the presence of God with them. There are Christians like that. Find them and get to know them 
and spend time with them. Timothy is one of them. And the Apostle Paul, who is in prison in Rome, Timothy is far away in Asia, you know, and he's in Turkey, the distance between, you know, Turkey and Rome. This is a big distance. Paul is writing to him and saying, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. And the Apostle Paul then remembers the faith, Timothy's faith. Timothy is a real Christian. Are you a real Christian? Or are you a Christian just in name? You know, Christian because you come to church or sometimes you're there in church on a Sunday and that's it. No, Timothy is a real Christian. Timothy is a Christian once he leaves the church. He is always the same. He is always walking with God. He is always loving Jesus. He is always praying. He is always believing. I am reminded, he says in verse 5, of your sincere faith, a faith that first dwelt in your grandmother Lois. So maybe this dear lady uh, is not alive when Paul is writing. Because the Paul is reminiscing uh, his Timothy's grandmother, how Timothy's grandmother loved the Lord Jesus. You know, thank God if you have you know, fathers and mothers that love Jesus. Thank God for that. You know, it's a very special thing to have parents who love Jesus and to have grandparents who love Jesus. First of all, it was in your grandmother and now your mother and your mother Eunice and now I am sure dwells in you as well. Somebody has said, God has no grandchildren. Do you know that God doesn't have any grandchildren? I have a grandchild, but God doesn't have grandchildren. In other words, just because there are people in your family who love Jesus doesn't mean, and you know, they cannot pass that on to you. They can pass many other things to you. They can pass you, you know, other habits and teach you and bring you up, you know, to be like them. But they can't make you a Christian. You have to be born again. God has to work in your life. Listen to our Savior in the Gospel of John, chapter 1 and verse 12. You know, uh, he says here, <clears throat> When he came to his own, his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him. So you have to receive. Other people cannot receive salvation, you know, by proxy on your account. You have to turn to Jesus. You have to believe. You have to walk. You can't rely on other people being Christians. As many to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. In other words, it was God who gave them this birth. That's why Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Nicodemus, you have to have this birth, you have to have this beginning from heaven. And you have to be changed, you have to be transformed inside. But Nicodemus, you cannot do it yourself. Other people cannot do it for you. Your parents cannot do it for you. Your country cannot. Many people in Cyprus think they are Christians because they are Cypriots. They were born in this country. No, my dear friend, we all have to be born again. We have to be saved. We have to be converted. You and I have to believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Timothy believed. Oh yes, he, he saw what his mother, what God had done in his mother's life, what God had done in his grandmother's life. But Paul says, now I am sure this sincere faith dwells in you as well. Secondly, the Apostle Paul encourages Timothy to rekindle it. 
fire. You know, we were singing, uh, great hymn. Sweet words. For thou who camest from above, the pure celestial fire to impart. You know, the fire, it's, it's a, it goes back to the day when Moses saw this fire at the foothills of Mount Sinai. And he saw this bush that was burning. It was on fire, but it was not being consumed. And Moses came near and to examine what was going on. He was absolutely taken aback by this sight. And then he heard a voice saying, calling his name. Moses, take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. God was in the bush. That is why the bush was on fire. And this is what the new birth is, really. It is God coming in you. It is the Spirit of God coming in you, upon you, and indwelling you. And it is the fire. Fire is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And it consumes, but it doesn't reduce the person. It consumes the consumption. O thou who camest from above, the pure celestial fire, kindle a flame of secret love on the mean altar of my heart. There let it for thy glory burn with an inextinguishable blaze and trembling to its source return in humble prayer and fervent prayer. The Lord Jesus spoke to him from heaven to his church in Ephesus. And in Revelation chapter 2, this is what he said to Ephesus. Very powerful words. Seven churches. You know, sometimes we are like Ephesus, sometimes we are like Smyrna, sometimes we are like Thyatira, sometimes we are like Pergamon. Where are we today? Where are you today as a Christian? <coughs> and is the flame. Is it almost, you know, it feels as if it dies down. The flame of love. Do you remember the day, maybe, if you haven't never, maybe this, today might be the day. Do you remember the day when the love of Jesus captured you for the first time? When the first time, when God opened your eyes and you believed, you believed and you came to trust in Jesus as your Savior. And Jesus saved you, he forgave you your sins and you loved him and you loved him so much with all your heart, you loved him with your soul. You loved him with your being. You loved him with your mind. You loved him with your heart. You loved him with your eyes, with your mouth, with your lips, you loved him. And you know that love, it can go cold, it can go cold, and our hearts can become so hard, like other things can come into that place and, and we can start loving other things. We can start loving money, we can start loving work, we can start loving other people. This is what happened to Ephesus. Could Jesus be saying this to you and to me? I know he says to them, I know you're very you're working very hard, you're evangelizing, you're doing everything, you've got church leaders. I know that you are enduring patiently and bearing for my you're even suffering. But I have this against you that you have abandoned the love that you had at first. Jesus says to Ephesus, we don't love. Do you know we could have everything as a church? but not have love for Jesus. And that is the biggest thing that we can have, the biggest possession that we have, can have is love for Jesus. That's why Paul writes to Timothy, Timothy, you have received this gift, and Paul was instrumental in it. You know, he talks about laying on of hands. Uh, that can mean figuratively, it doesn't mean necessarily, you know, uh, that Paul laid his hands upon Timothy and something happened. No, no, no. It is, uh, this is a figurative view that Paul was instrumental in, of course, Timothy hearing the gospel, in believing, and Timothy's conversion, 
And Paul may have prayed along with other people that Timothy as a young man will be blessed and that God will anoint him with the Holy Spirit and may raise him up to be a leader in the church. But nevertheless, no matter where we are as young Timothys today, this is something that we all as believers have, is the gift of God. The gift of God is the Holy Spirit. The gift of God is salvation. The gift of God is forgiveness. The gift of God is the presence of Jesus. And Paul says, kindle it. So it's a flame, right? And Paul says, you have to keep choking up the fire, stirring up the fire so that this flame of love on the sacred, on the main altar of your heart, that it is burning, that it is burning furiously. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. Fan into flame. See, this flame can die. It can almost, you know, it can become a little, little, you know, thing. Fan into flame the gift of God. How can we do that? How can we revive the three good men who came last month? How can we revive the faith, the hope, and the love that is in us? Sometimes, you know, our weak knees get weary. Not only because of age, but in our Christian work, our knees can become weary. We can get tired. And our hands and our arms and limbs, you know, they become heavy and we can start dragging ourselves and always think, well, maybe, maybe I don't need to be, you know, to be there. Maybe I don't need fellowship. Maybe I can stay away from church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. My dear friend, no, no, no. Like Moses, you know, the Amalekites came and uh, they have to, Israelites had to defeat the Amalekites. But, uh, you know, Moses was standing up and he was holding his hands up and it was symbolical of Moses crying out to God for power that Israel who is fighting the Amalekites would defeat them but you know the, the battle was very fierce and as time was going on and Moses his arms is getting tired and his arms were beginning to go down and as soon as his arms were beginning to go down the Amalekites were getting stronger. And that is Amalekite is a sin of unbelief. Amalekites is full of doubts. Amalekites is backsliding. Amalekites is being in love with the world. And as soon as the arms of Moses would go down, the Amalekites would get stronger and stronger. And then Moses would stir himself up and lift his arms up again. And then Israel would become strong again. And then, of course, after a while, he would get tired again and the arms would start going down. So in the end, what they did was they brought Moses to a place where they put uh, rocks or, st or stone, somehow, whatever it was, under his arms so that his arms would stay up all the time. And then when the evening came, the Amalekites were defeated. Hallelujah. That's what Paul is talking about. To encourage one another. How can we do that? Well, read. Reading is very important as a Christian. Read. Read about past victories. Or the victories of faith. You know, have you ever read Hebrews chapter 11? It talks about men and women faith the faith of Rahab the faith of Israel the faith of Moses and all the people when Jericho was defeated Jericho was a very big city and it had this wall of you know about 12 14 feet 
around it. And no one could ever defeat Jericho. And God said to Israel, well, I want you to not lift a stone and throw at it, not shoot an arrow. I just want you to walk around it <clears throat> every day. And on the seventh day, walk seven times and then shout. And when you shout, the wall will fall down. And you know, you, have to, you need faith to believe that this is what will happen. And it did. And on the seventh day, they marched around the place seven times. And then they shouted, there you are. The name of God and the wall of Jericho came down. You know, David, David, David was just a young boy. And he was standing before this giant of a man called Goliath. And Goliath has got this shiny armor. And he's got a spear that is bigger than this room. And everyone who saw Goliath was shaking on their knees. And David said, I will go and fight this giant. And they said, well, hey, you're a little boy. What are you going to do? He says, do you know that when I was looking after the sheep, a lion came out of nowhere and grabbed the sheep. And David said, I ran after the lion and with my bare hands, I open the mouth of the lion and rescue the sheep. But David says, it was the power of God. It wasn't me. It was God. It was the power of God. The God who delivered me from the jaw of the lion and from the paw of the bear. He will deliver Israel this day from this time. So, read about faith, men of faith. Read about Peter, read about Paul, read about the martyrs, my dear friend. Read about revivals. Read about what God has done for his church. What God is doing for his church in parts where it is impossible to be a Christian. In China, I was listening and we will see it. I, I couldn't get it ready for today. And how People would wake up early in the morning at 4 o'clock in the morning and go to secret meetings in China. And, you know, in a room like that, they jump out about two, three hundred people crowding and they worship God. And they're in this tower block and they didn't realize that there was, there was another church up on this building who was also secretly meeting. Read about missionaries. To encourage you, to stir you up. You know, there was a man called John Baton um, a couple of hundred years ago. He went out to the Outer Hebrides, somewhere out there near Papua Guinea, New Zealand. He went to this island there as a missionary and with his young wife, and then he had a wee baby, and they were in this uh, tribal place, you know, where people, you know, they were like savages, they, they were not civilized at all. So he's preaching to them, he learned their language, he started preaching to them. And one day, one night, the whole gang of this tribesmen, they surrounded their little hut with bows and arrows and flames of fire. And they were ready to attack their little hut. And so John Payton, he got down on his knees with his beloved wife. He says, the Lord brought us here. He will take care of us. And they started reading all the promises of God, started believing them, started praying. And all night long, those armed men stood around their heart, ready to attack, but not one of them shot an arrow. And the next day when John got out of his hut, those guys were standing there. And he said, why didn't you attack us? He said, who are the, who is that army that was surrounding your hut? We couldn't come near your hut. We couldn't lift a finger because all those soldiers standing around your hut, who were they? Do you know that's absolutely stirring? God is like this. God says, you know, that the angel of the Lord shall encamp around about them that fear him and deliver them. And God will do it. 
and God will protect his people and God will protect his servants. Read about these people. Get up and pray. Stir yourself up. That's what Paul is saying to Timothy. Timothy, stir yourself up. Oh, the gift of God is there, but you've got to stir, you've got to play your part in reviving this gift, in fanning the flame. The Bible says, you know, James says in chapter 4, verse 8, draw near to God and God will draw near to you. When you draw near to God, you will discover, my dear friend, that God is there, he's waiting for you, he's waiting for you. In the Song of Solomon, the, the bridegroom and the bride, and you know, he, was, he came and he comes and he's knocking at the door. Open to me, my beloved, my dove, my beloved. But she was so lazy. She was saying, you know, I, I, you know, I wash my feet, you know, I'm, I'm not ready for this, you know, and she's sleeping away. And then he went away. And when he went away, she ran after him. It's a spiritual song. It's a song about our relationship with God. And then she stirred herself up. Where is my beloved? Where is my beloved? And she started then singing praises about her beloved. My beloved is better than 10,000 soldiers. My beloved is handsome. My beloved is ruddy. My beloved has locks like no one else. My beloved has eyes and his mouth is so sweet. And my beloved is altogether lovely. And there he was again. Timothy, stir up the flame. Then repositioning very quickly. Timothy, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Are you willing, my dear friend, to stand with persecuted Christians? Are you willing to stand with those men and women who are despised, who are hated, who are laughed at, jeered at, spoken against, because they love Jesus. How important it is in our discipleship as Christians to identify ourselves with those. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Are you ashamed anywhere at all to be known for who you really are, that you are a Christian. Do not be ashamed. Not of me, you his prisoner, but share. That's a very powerful word. It's a compound word in, in the original, meaning, you know, you know, share together, suffer together, suffer with me, endure hardship with me, as if you are there. Paul is in prison. And he's saying to Timothy, Timothy, be as if you are with me here. Do not be ashamed. Why? Because I am not ashamed. He was singing about that. For I know, because I am not ashamed, because I know whom I am believed. And I am convinced, I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Timothy, because I love Jesus and I know Jesus and I know that Jesus will keep me. Jesus will keep me. Timothy, don't be ashamed. And then finally, the Apostle Paul encourages Timothy by speaking about those people <clears throat> who refreshed him. How wonderful it is. I thank God for people in my life who refresh me. Revive me. Paul talks about, you know, when he was in prison here, something happened to him. Most of his friends forsook him. And he was all alone, but he was not alone. Certainly people who were with him were no longer with him. They just said, oh, we don't know this Paul anymore. We are going. <laughs> Goodbye. You are aware, he says in verse 15, 
that all who are in Asia turned away from me, <clears throat> among whom are Pelagius and Harmonagus. We don't know the real reason why they left him. They abandoned him. They fall. We don't know this Paul anymore. But may the Lord grant mercy to the household of Anesiphorus. Anesiphorus means someone who be, is useful, is being useful. And I didn't realize, you know, there's something in the way that the Apostle Paul speaks about this man. Just let me read them first. May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Anesiphorus, for he often refreshed me. And was not ashamed of my chains, but when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me earnestly and found me. And may the Lord grant him to find mercy from the day, from the Lord on that day. And you well know all the service he rendered in Ephesus. What am I saying? This Paul, maybe Paul is talking about Nesiphorus, who is no more. That Anasiphorus has died. And that is why Paul prays for his family. May the Lord encourage, may the Lord grant mercy to the household of Anasiphorus. Anasiphorus is no more. And when Anasiphorus was alive, he was not ashamed. He was not ashamed of the gospel. He was not ashamed of Jesus. He was not ashamed of the Bible. He was not ashamed of Christians who were suffering, including Apostle Paul. <clears throat> no matter what the cost, he didn't mind. And he often refreshed me. Paul is missing in Nasiphorus. He is. And he's talking about him in the past. And as for us, when he was alive, he refreshed me. When he used to come to me, we used to talk about what God has done, what God is doing. We used to talk about the Bible, we used to talk about the Word, and he used to refresh me. He used to revive me. And even the Apostle Paul needed reviving. And if he did, how much more I and you and me and when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me earnestly until he found me. And may the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. That is why we think Anasiphorus has died. Are you encouraged? You know, it's very easy to be discouraged, to be disappointed in people, things like that. But let it not weigh you down. Encourage one another. All the more since the day is approaching. Think about what God has done for other people. Read about missionaries. Read about men and women who, so you know there were these women in Scotland uh, not so long ago and they were tied to a stone and you know, told that as the tide was coming in and they were going to be drowned, all they had to do was to deny Jesus Christ. And one of them had just given birth to a baby and they brought her baby so that she could hear her baby crying and deny Jesus and she would be saved. No, she said, the Lord will take care of my baby. I am not going to deny. Will you stand up for Jesus? Will you stand up for Jesus today? Will you stand up for Jesus tomorrow? May the Lord make you a Timothy. Father, we thank you for our young Timothy who remained faithful as far as we know until the very end. And maybe like him and Paul and Peter and many others, be faithful, love Jesus with all of our hearts. Kindle that flame of sacred love on the main altars of our hearts. Today we pray, come to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Amen. Amen. We will sing a song. Uh, who has helped?